Hey guys, Son of Beast here. Um, I hope you guys are staying home and staying healthy right now for uh, for the rest of the summer of your of the uh, of amazing day. But I know this year was kind of kind of getting a little bit worse. But uh, we're sure we're trying to get this uh, thing right. We're trying to uh, we're trying to make sure we can stop the coronavirus out there. For those of you who are like wearing masks, thank you for socially distance and thank you all to the first responder of our heroes helping people with care. So. So this time, I would like to take you guys back to 2018 of uh, last year, I mean, two years ago. And then last year, we went to Tampa Bay um, in 2019 by that moment for, excuse me, by the USA Hockey, uh, this Disabled Hockey. And we, um, for those of you, who were, we were going to Las Vegas, but unfortunately, it was postponed until, uh, until the day of fall. So I'm uh, just letting you guys know, um, everything's going on really good. I know. I'm, I'm just. I'm just. I'm um, here to see you guys again. Uh, I hope you. Uh, hope you have a night, Have a fantastic uh, school year or something like that. I would like to say thank you to our class of 2020. Oh yeah, you can see right there. These are the metal hacks I. Uh, I have earned. They're right here. Check it out. Look at that. This metal hack. This is my metals that are placing the rack on here without placing it to the door. It looks very nice. I. I really love using this rack so much. I decided I want to hang it up so I don't want to uh, make it banging around here to close the door for some reasons. So right now we're going to be showing you what 2018 looks like um, in Chicago, and we've done we've seen a bunch many buildings this time for once, uh, once and twice, or once a year for once per day uh, when we were at um, Chicago for USA Ho Disabled Hockey Festival. Now, um, for some of you who are saying is, um, have you, uh, have you visited Chicago? And I did, and I said yes with my team, but I no, not myself. But, um, I really, I really love going to Chicago, and it's kind of like very nice to see the whole buildings around here. Um, except, um, except it's not really large, uh, compared to New York City and Chicago right from here. But, um... New York City is more large. It has larger amount of buildings. It's big than uh, than Chicago or any cities around. So yes, I know this is something that we uh, we have never uh, discussed about. But with that being said, um, we're going to be seeing what the boat looks like and showing you around the buildings that you that you're going to see. And then if you like the video, don't forget subscribe to my channel. You can also follow me on my social media, and uh, you can. Uh, Thumbs up to like the video. Just making sure that it's all good. So anyway, now let's let's see what the flashback will look like. And I hope you guys enjoy this uh, video of each buildings around on the boat. So with that, let's get started. Enjoy the show, team, and let's get going. Sailboats, the tall masts, so they have to be able to work, right? They have to be able to open them up in less than a minute and close them in less than a minute. And if they have any kind of problems, they have to work on it. All right. So, now, this bridge is very important. It's a 1920 bridge. 1920. Almost 100 years old. When this bridge was built, the real estate around here became very, very valuable. The first building, first building after the bridge, the Wrigley Building, the old chewing gum corporate headquarters. 1921, sister building, 1924, Grand Madison, and White. The next one, up here on the left, it's got the caved in front. That's 1923, the Alfred Allschuler. The next one, immediately to the right, the one that looks so gothic, the Chicago Tribune building, 1925 by House and Hood. And lastly, look directly to the left, the tall skinny building is 1921, that is an Art Deco building designed by Hollywood and Root. So they all went up from 1921 to 1928 after the bridge went up because real estate became very, very important. So we're about to go under our first one. Remember the, wherever you see the lights, that's where they split and open up. That's Jules and French word that means seesaw. They have to open up in less than a minute and close them in less than a minute. All right, I'm going to be talking about buildings over here on the left side. The building that looks like it's concave, as I said, is 1923 by Alfred Allschuler. It was a commercial building, meaning it was a business building. There was an important insurance company in there to insure the shipping and all the boats on the river. Well, the building was in good shape, but the company moved out. And so here's our first adaptive reuse building. 
This is now the London House Hotel. And that was designed and finished out by Jim Ketch. And he also added the glass addition on the back end. So that was finished two years ago. It's a four-star hotel. $250 million for the whole package. And you can get married up there in, in, in the cupola. It's a very popular place right now. The tall white one that looks like a rocket ship or a pencil. It has an address name of 75 East Wacker. It was back in 1928 and designed by Riddle and Riddle. It was an office building. Now it is the Club Corners Hotel, so that's an adaptive reuse building. And for a couple of months in 1928, that was the tallest building here in the city. I was the no longer, 42 floors. And by the way, the elevator stops at floor 37. So if you get a room above that, you have to schlep your own bags up the staircase, but you get a room which is 360 degrees. You're the only one up there. Oh, look at that. So it's kind of a handy wow. place. That's pretty interesting. For those who like good views. The Blue and Silver Building is a modern building. 1958, designed by Milton Schwartz. It's been owned a lot by different companies. It's always been some kind of a hotel. Now it's owned by the Wyndham Company. If you saw one of the Batman movies, The Dark Knight, uh, the 30th, well, was used by uh, Christian Bale, the actor. The whole movie was filmed out there in Chicago. Over here on the left side again, this is the Riverwalk. This is constructed between 2014 to 2016, about $120 million. A lot of steel and a lot of concrete to, to bring this out. And you have restaurants like Volcox, Big Fish, and all kinds of activities going on. Most of the restaurants are closed though, right now. All right, the building that looks like a giant candle is from 1926 by Jaiver and Dingleberg. It's an office building. Today, uh, Helmut Jan, the great German-American architect, has his office right by the green clock, and he uses the Belvedere as his uh, presentation room. That's supposedly the TV show The Good Wife took place in. The tall white building, it's from 1962. It was the tallest marble clad building in America for many years. Now it's owned by Ken Russell, and that's why Ken is up there. Uh, it's owned by Kevin Shaw. We've got it. It's from 1991. It's the Renaissance Hotel by William Taylor. Look at the big gray one, though. Now, this is a postmodern building made to look like an older one from an older style, but this was finished in 1989 and designed by Kevin Roach. Born in Ireland, but educated here in the States. He just turned 96 and still an active architect in New York. So this is by Kevin Roach and John Dickelow, the big gray building. Now, it is also the home quarters for the Leo Burnett Advertising Company. You, you deserve a break today. Bill Jury Gordon, our world man, all came out of that building. one right beside it is an address name of 75 West on Wacker. This is designed by a man from from, uh, from Spain. His name is Ricardo Bofield. Now look at the bottom. You see the elements of classical design. He also put a temple up on top. So he likes classical designs, but he's living in postmodern times. So this is a 1992 building. And this is the headquarters for ATM. Archie Daniel Midland, who moved here from the of Decatur, Illinois. They make a lot of food products, but what they really make, which you all use, is ethanol. That's that material that you put in your gas tank. The tall blue glass building is from 2014. That is an upscale apartment building. It's not by Gary Hundell of New York. The tall one here, right beside it, the Art Deco. Limestone clad, it's from 1930, designed by Hollywood and Root. Why is the building set back? Why is the tower set back? Because we passed the setback law here in 1923. 
frankly, I have to be careful when I say this, we have people from New York on board. We did not want to go away to New York with these tall towers running along the sidewalk because then the sun can never hit the sidewalk. This is a dark city in the wintertime. You have a low sun, lots of clouds, and so by putting the tower back, the sunlight can enter the building. Now, you don't need the sun to, to actually light the office, but you need the sun for your psyche. So it's called a setback law, and that's a good example of Art Deco Auto Place, 1930. This next building is actually two buildings. You can see they're a little bit different. The eastern two-thirds on the, on the left here is from 1927, designed by Graham Madison, Probst and White. 59 years later, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, now called SOM, put on an addition. That's the glass bay windows, and they also put a four-story glass mansion roof. Why do we call this the Builder's Building? If you ever bought a condo, ever bought a house, brand new, and you got to remember to pick everything out, the cabinets and the, and the ceramic and the carpeting and all the bathroom fixtures, right? Well, guess what? Contractors still put their examples in there. So anything that's been fixed out or built brand new, that's where you go to pick those things out. So we still call it the builder's building. Look at this bridge. Well Street Bridge, we're going down there. This is only two years old. The other one was 99 years old, we're showing its age. It got chopped up and lowered down with cranes and helicopters and barged out. The new parts were barged in, lifted up with cranes and helicopters, and they put it together in about three months. Well Street Bridge. All right, next building, over here on the left. Look at the American flag at, on the bottom. What is that up on top? Oh, it looks like a bunch of bridges. Why do you have a bunch of bridges on the top of a building? There's no river up there. Well, look at all the bridges down here. So what's that word? Contextual. The architects, PSK from New York, were affected by the building's location. By the way, the louver there, that, that window, works. They're sucking in fresh air, filtering it, and blowing stale air out to the top of the building. It's a 1991 building. Oh, the building. We've had a very cold spring. Let's hope they can bring up. But look at the building here. This building is 1984. Again designed by PFK of New York. It's the Nuveen building. Now look at the shape. And look at the color. How contextual is this? We've got two shades of green. The water is green. Why is the building bending like this? Because the river is bending. We're about to come up here and make a right turn and go up the north bank here. The North Branch, so the building truly reflects the geographic location. So that is a beautiful, contextual building. PFK actually won a, a design award the following year in 1985. Wow. The is a stack of By the way, the louvers work. They're sucking in fresh air, long, stale air off the top. All right, look straight ahead. This building is called River Point. It's got an arc on the bottom and an arc up on top. This is designed by Picard and Chilton. This building is an infant, it's less than a year old. Oh, wow. And it's a gold leaf building at 52 floors. And look, it's got portholes down here, which is throwing a porthole. All the buildings on this side of the river are built over railroad tracks, Amtrak as well as the local metro line. So when the trains go underneath the building, they obviously blow the smoke out here and don't want to blow it inside the building. It's a beautiful building. Less than a year old. The restaurants are off to the side. And you know, it has a river walk. We have an ordinance here. When you design and build a building along the river, though your property line comes out to the water, you must provide public access. And even the park up there, two and a half acre park, anybody can use it. And you can walk up and down. That's an ordinance. This building, look how it's bending and look how skinny it is. This is a 2002 building designed by Jim Stefano. This building is all about people who live here. We have townhouses on the bottom. Now townhouses are larger than condos, but you don't get the view because you're on the bottom. Now the building is so skinny, 
it cannot have ramps that you can ramp up your automobile. So how do you get your car in there? Well, there's openings on the back end. You and your car pulls in an elevator, takes you up to the parking lot. Up those milky gray windows in between. So you have townhouses, the parking lot, and then condos up on top. 2002. And of course, nobody's behind you. So all the condos look east, and they also look west. You get a little view. The kind of a pinkish red building here is the oldest building on the tour. Not the oldest building in Chicago, but the oldest building on the tour, 1898. Designed by Frank Abbott. This was a freezer building. Remember, we used to slaughter all kinds of animals here, right? Well, how do you chill them so that the fresh meat can get to Boston, can get to L.A.? There was a chill in here down to 37 degrees and then out to the boxcars. The top was a giant refrigerator. All those fruits and veggies from the western and southern states were put up there, chilled, and then out to the grocery stores. But that business model changed, so the building was converted to condominiums in 1981. Harry Reese also designed the river cottages here. This is a 1988 project. Only four units in here. The largest is 4,200 square feet. The smallest is 2,600 square feet. Each one gets a boat dock, an elevator, and a garage. One of them finally sold. You can't go by 1988 prices. That's too long ago. What do they really worth? Well, they were sold about a year and a half ago. That was the one for 2,600 feet. How much do you think they got? 5.8 million. What? No, no. This is a city. Designed by the white lady, the boys, and they were right. Bingo, things began to happen. Look right over here. Look across here on the left side. Beautiful townhouses for Papa George and Davis, 2002 and 2005. You can't touch any of these units for those sort of things. Nago Hartray designed the beautiful apartment building, finished in 2005. Look at the beautiful apartment complex over here on the right hand side. Designed by Salman Kobo and Vents. 327 units. Are you smelling cocoa? Yeah. yeah. The large, I, I kid you not, the largest cocoa manufacturing company in the world is about a half a mile that way. So anytime we get a wind out of the north and north west, you don't mind that it's real. They don't make much candy, but they sell the Hershey's and Milky Way and all kinds of other companies. But they buy all kinds of cocoa. Okay, look over here to the right. This is called the River Bank Lofts Building. It's from 1909, so it's one of the early warehouses designed by George Nimmons and George Fellows. Now, after the warehouse days, it did it just became a manufacturing building. Actually, the typewriters and well, that all went off with the computer. So it sat empty and they fixed the open, so it just converted this into upscale condos. Anytime you see balconies wired on like that, you know that it's a, it's a conversion. And now look at the parking lot. The city has an ordinance. You must build so much parking in, whether it's a uh, commercial building or a building that you live in. How much are those parking spots down here? Yeah, 45 or 45,000 dollars. One spot. You can sell it separately. You can get a lien on it. You can sell it separately. Townhouses on the bottom and condos up on top. This beautiful park is called the Aaron Montgomery Ward Park. And it's a pocket park, which means they're small, but people like them. Now it's kind of a chilly day, but some people are out here. They were really out here yesterday when I did this tour. But it's a nice place to walk your pets, to walk your children, and, and do, do a little bit of showing the frisbee. Okay, now for the buildings. The two silver gray ones were designed by Lucy Lagrange. Born in Paris, France, and educated in Montreal at McGill University. So these are both condos, Erie on the Park and Kingsbury on the Park. Parking lot is in the base of the building. Look at the older building, the older brick, the red brick with the water tower. That's what this whole area was. This is old factory warehouse in here. And I hope they never tear them down. Yeah, that's our integrity, that's our history, that's what this city is really all about. A city of big shoulders, a lot of manufacturing. The uh, mosaic there is called the Confluence. And we have a bark park over here. Where, you know, dogs make friends, and you got a walking dog, and people make friends because their dogs make friends. You know, but I've seen cats in there. 
I see cougars. <laughs> Guys, don't worry. These cougars have four legs now, too. You know, you're the cougars. Oh, Shock. I've seen pot belly pigs. And if somebody tried to bring in a snake last year, they'd say, yeah, I don't know. No snakes allowed. You never know. All right. This complex, right here on the right, two buildings. One is called Two River Place and One River Place. This is designed by Papa George and Ames. Uh, this opening, they got one. A great recession here in 2009, 10, 11. Knocked off a lot of buildings. You know, people went bankrupt. Architects were laid off. If you don't know that, it happened here a lot throughout America. But this, this, these two units got done in 2008. And a lot of them were sold. And it's been a great recession here, too. They did okay. These are beautiful condos. 10 foot ceilings, very modern. Parking lot is on the back end of the building, obviously, by the street. But the side by the top Look at this building. Ah, look at it. Look at the balconies that are wired out. No, that's not original. This is a 1930 warehouse. One of the Arizona Derby Wards, been designed by Willis McCauley, who was an in house architect for Wards. Wards went belly up. That's a big store chain here. Went belly up in 2001 at the expression of the Safeway Bankruptcy. And the building said after a fixed year and associates converted this into an upscale apartment building. Now, on the back end of the building is a ziggurat and a wonderful statue up on top. When we turn around, remind me to point it out, we can't see it now. Yeah, we're gonna go back now. Look at this cruddy bridge. <laughs> this is what it looks like when it needs maintenance. Black. We have to scrape off that bus and we have to paint it. We do this about every 20 years, that thing is gone over here. Anyway. This building, look at this thing, Woo! It really mirrors the state of Illinois. But you've been drawing up your mountain climbing and skiing here, haven't you? Yeah. I didn't think you had to hear anything. Yeah, our mountains are called skyscrapers. This building truly reflects the purely state of Illinois. Before anybody invented the word contextual, look at this, folks. This is 1908, designed by Schmidt Gardner and Merton. And look at the beautiful original curves designs and also up on top. But look at the spadrels. That's the stuff that's in between the floors. See how they stick out more than appears to run up and down? They're really accenting the horizontal nature of the building. 1908. And when Wards went belly up again in 2001, building said empty. But Gensler and another architects divided up the building. Now you have a number of companies in there. Have any of you ever used the uh, Groupon? I understand. And those are now condominiums. That's called the domain. And that's the the boats. Now look at the island over here. Look on the right hand side, back a little bit. That's called Goose Island. Now this, this is going to be a heck of a story. This is a man-made island. It shows up on the 1870 map. 1870 map. Right behind you, people started to dig, and they put a wall here, started to dig down there, and they dug for 12 years, from 1858 to 1870. What were they looking for? They don't have gold here, we don't have oil here. They're looking for good, good clay. That became our bricks. And they cut it for 12 years, and they ended up making this island. It is a mile long. If you got any farming in your blood, you know what 160 acres is. 160 acre island is shaped like a teardrop. Now, it was industrialized. A lot of that left, now it's being tech. A lot of tech companies are going in there. But look at the school over there. Kendall College of Culinary Arts and Hotel Management does very well on the island. And then Curry Materials, just a huge <coughs> baking company over there. Yeah, the so. and stuff. Okay, look over here on the right hand side. You can see the striping. Wait a minute, this was a parking lot. What happened? Well, they had to move out. Promise me that you'll come back a year from now, you'll see the beginning of five buildings here. Huge, big complex here. Some of them have to be very tall, but they'll be commercial and also condo, condo buildings going in there. All designed by Jim Dutch. They're supposed to break around this brick or something. And the property is owned by, by the Chicago Tribune. So they're going to retain the ownership of the land because they want the rare and the work. Okay, look left, look west, and look up. There's the ziggurat and the wonderful statue called the Age of Progress. That statue is 18 feet tall. It looks kind of small. called the Age of Progress. That's a beautiful building. Now, did you notice the building behind us? The windows? That's the last year of our early morning building. 1974, designed by a Japanese American architect, Joe Yamasaki. The board went belly up again in 2001. Building really sat empty, not very long, a year or three. And Papa George and Haynes got the contract 
to convert into condos. A million dollars condominium. Wow. <laughs> but a lot of the units are two and a half beds or three beds. I mean, each one is quite large. It's not small right here. Okay, over here. This is the Chicago Tribune printing area. 1981, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Now look how drab it is. And we asked SOM, why did you dress out the building? This is really looking nicer. Well, because we, when we designed this in the late 70s, none of these nice things were here. That's right, it looks drab. But this is where the Chicago Tribune is printed. That's our leading history. But they also print their competitor here, Chicago Sun Times. And they also print newspapers from the suburbs and the Midwest version of the, uh, of the Wall Street Journal. This is a 24-7 building. It never gets any rest. Now, they got 10 presses in here. When they're all working, and they're always, always working, 50,000 newspapers per hour are pumped out of here. So, the structural people, the engineers at SOM, told the company that was going to make it, you have to leave holes in the concrete floor. They said, what for? We're just going to strap the presses onto the concrete. No, this, these presses shake so much, you must anchor them down the bedrock, otherwise the building will be under an earthquake attack. And that's how much they vibrate. So the building has been standing since 1981. Good idea. Yeah, it's amazing. Bedrock is 80 feet down, steel bars are connected, so they can shake all they want, the building will stay up. Now I got a story to tell you. It's a railroad bridge. It has not been used for years. I can't use it. The locomotive and the train would run into the building. That's a good so this is not owned by the city. It's owned by the Union Pacific Railroad Company. But look at it. Probably ugly. Yeah. And that's okay because this is an ugly industrial area. Get the job, they get the tax, right? So you can see the, the counterweight. You can see the pivot. See what the engineer wants. And here's the story on this bridge. The federal government, <laughs> this is going to surprise a lot of you, the federal government controls the rivers and all the lakes in America, not the states. The federal government comes out every November and they tell the UP Railroad, you meet us here. Because this bridge has to work. You have to lower it in less than a minute, and you have to raise it up in less than a minute. It works. So when you say, well, why don't they take it out, Tom? They can't ever use it. I don't know. They leave it up. But it's a working place. Okay, this building right over here to the left. This is, I call this a concrete. It's about two years old. It's on that BLK. This is called Wolf Point West. This whole property here is called the Wolf Point. And this, we have to go back to history here. This is where the wigwams were, several TPs. Lots of log cabins. This is the area of the rich fur trade. The first Europeans in here were French. And they were trading with the Native Americans. Meek and beaver were the primary food. Muskrat was also wild. And then the natives wanted guns, brandy, blankets, and that kind of stuff. But this is what had happened right here. Now, over time, the Kennedy family bought this. The Kennedy family. You don't know who I'm talking about. See me after the tour. I don't have time to talk about it now. But Christopher announced his project a couple years ago. So this is an apartment building. They're building a second one where the crane is. When they get that one pretty much up and going, then they're going to build one in the center, which is going to be twice as tall as this one. This is called the Wolf Point Project in Chicago. It's going to be well over $8 billion. They're looking at 2022-2023 to get involved. Now the Kennedys aren't the only ones to get money in this project. Heinz and the other folks are huge. Alright, now we're going up the South Branch. This is a different breed of cat. Not going to be factories down here. Not going to be too many warehouses either. This is our banking area. This is our corporate area. Always was a little bit different, right? So let's talk about this building over here on the left. This is a 1910 warehouse. It's called the Great Lakes Building, just not by Halvard and Rose. But it was converted into modern offices in the 1960s. The big black one right here is from, 19, is from 1975, designed by Joe Hillman. It's a good example of modern architecture. And the parking lot is right behind the black screen. Now the building is a little bit, so the parking lot is Oh. 
North side, 860, 880, Lakeshore Drive, 1949 and 1950. The first modern buildings in America were in this city. The beach part of IIT, so you have to suffer quite a lot of modernism and postmodern. This is called Gateway 3, reinforced concrete building, and look at the steel exits. This is where the Merc was, so you want open floor plates. This is a tiny floor. And look what I did. We made it into a fitness center and also a restaurant. The modernism gives you the avenue of changing out the building because you don't have inside pillars. It's really easy to convert a lot of the Look at this building. The big green one on the right. This is, for me, drawing my bias here, this is one of my favorite buildings. 1984, Jimmy Stefano designed it, but then he was the lead designer at SOM. How contextual is this? Look at the green glass. The gym, he puckered the windows in the corners and made them look like water. It's like you're sliding past the building where we are. You're sliding on water. And then he shifted the building to the left because the river is shifting to the left. How contextual is that? Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've seen this building before. It's done a lot of television commercials and a lot of uh, programs and a lot of movies. You just didn't know what you were looking at. Hollywood loves this big building, either from the front side, from the top of the canal, or from the river side. Let's see what we I didn't know we had a prison down here, did you? Oh, this is maggot. Look how terrible this is. Wow. Well, it was never a prison. This is one of the old post offices. 
the front part oh. is 1921. <laughs> the wings are on the side, they connected to the building in the back. That's 1932. Both of them were designed by Grand Mass and Wood. So why would Chicago need the world's largest post office? Because I don't care where you live, folks, you had to have the telephone book. Big yellow pages and regular ones, and then you had to have all these catalogs. I don't care where you live, those catalogs and the telephone books are pretty good in Chicago. So you need a big building to ship them all out. These guys are working for them. Now, over time, so many of these are books, so many of these are zip codes. They have been a lot of problems with the elevators. The building became obsolete. So the federal government closed it in 1996. Hang on, the new one's coming up. It was sold, finally, in 2009, to a man by the name of Bill Davies, who lived in London, UK. But he was a wealthy man, so he lived in the garage and got his place. So after several years, he wasn't doing anything with this building. Roof was caving in, bombs were living in there, all the people were starting fires, it was a mess, just a complete mess. So our mayor lost it. Called up Davies and said, you can it. You've been sitting on this building, you only paid the inside money for it. The artwork in there is worth the inside money. If you don't do something real quick, we're going to get the top of that domain, you're going to get your 25 million pass and not them anymore. And David said, wait, chill, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to do something. Well, let's go. He sold it within a couple of months. What did he get? I read an article. Anybody hear about this building? I got it from the paper last week. It's been purchased. All the condo, they had a vote in here. The company that bought it is going to buy out all the condos. It's going to return to be an apartment building. Reverse. Big money is coming in. Okay, look at this open spot here. Look at this huge open area here. Over here on, on the left hand side. You got some newer buildings, but you also see some old ones. But why is it even open? Like, you didn't see this on the north side of the Oh boy, it was all enclosed, right? What's this all about? Well, the quiet president in the 1950s was who? The white David Eisenhower. His most important bill was creating the interstate highway system. He signed that bill in 1954, and we began to make the interstate highways in 1955. We're up to 292,000 miles of those things. Why do I say this? Because this microphone, your cup, your iPhone, all the food in your tummy, and all your clothes, the era of the railroad became a mission. We used to have over 225,000 miles of track. We've got less than 175,000. Railroads have been down to raw materials. Oil, stone, sand, wheat, that's it. All our consumer goods come by truck because of the interstate highways. You've driven, you've been driving on these roads. I drive on them. Sometimes there's more trucks than cars. And so what, what am I saying now? This used to be a huge rail yard. Huge rail. You can't build a bridge across Lake Michigan. All those freights and all those trains from the East Coast will come into here. There are no less than three large train stations we're going to do. And they all got destroyed. We're not going to need them anymore. We're not going to need these tracks. Rome is not built in a day. Chicago cannot be built in a day either. But this is going to be a huge project. And it's right beside a wonderful example of Perry School design. This is a 1914 building designed by George Nimmons. And uh, this was another food building, but more like soup cans and Kleenex and, um, and, and, and uh, the cereal box. It was more like that. It wasn't you know, the raw produce and the raw meat. This was a different kind of food building. And then it was changed out into modern offices in the 1960s. And now it's become the technical whirlpool. It's around the technical things that we do. So this, this is our river north, ladies and gentlemen. And this is this is our high tech area. A lot of new design, industrial design, fashion design, 
computer, computer engineering, all in this neck of the woods. Anybody here at attorney? Here's your building. American Bar, 1987. Designed by Skid Row. Now look at that. That's all going to be changed up. That's why there's nothing going on. They're going to gut the, the bottom of the building and they're going to bring it down just like the office store. And it's going to be an event space. Weddings, banquets, close to $50 million makeover. So it's going to be coming down. The building in the middle, the back of the boat, you can see it, is designed by Dirk Lohan. It's a wonderful gold leaf building. Dirk is the grandson of this. He was born and raised in Germany. He came to Chicago for his master's. Here's Mr. Organic Architecture. You've seen these two. Bob Newhart show, various movies, a bunch of television commercials. This is the famous Marina City. Hard to believe, but it's true. These are going up when I was in high school here in the 60s. One was finished in 1962, the other in 1963. Now, if you've ever seen round, circular, tall buildings in your city or your country, this is the world's first two. Goldberg was teaching architects how to do this. And remember, this is built in, in silk and mud. This is a riverbank building. Incredibly done in the early 60s. They were apartments and they were converted to condos sometime in the 1990s. A lot of people here in the suburbs are buying these as a second home. Because Chicago is a, a lot of nice things going on year round. So they're buying these as a second home. Alright, here's Mises' last building. If you're old enough like me, you might remember this as the IBM building, 1971. Now it's the AMA Plaza. But this is Mises' last building, 1971. He died in 1969. His students, you can hear his name, Fujikawa Johnson, his grandson, Dirk Lohan, finished the building for him. They just took his plans and finished it. They had become professional. Now, Toronto people, you've got Mises Hollis, the 56 stores, the TV, the This is Mises' last one, and it's at 52 floors. If you're into modernism, you ought to go into that lobby. It gets open 24-7 because it's now the Langham Hotel is on the bottom. And you see a wonderful monument to Mies. Escaping Nazi Germany, totally broke, totally broke. It'll quote, borrow money from America. Starts teaching, starts to practice, and virtually reinvents the country. He got his wings here. He took off from the Grandview Naval Air Base, and he landed in the lake in the first aircraft carriers. The first aircraft carriers were not built in the ocean. They were built here in Lake Michigan. They took World War I airships and knocked the tops off. They put a bunch of boards down. And that's how we got the word flat top. And you had to land your plane nine times without killing yourself. Not easy to do. 24 pilots either hit the water or hit that ship and they were killed immediately. <laughs> All but, two, all but two of those planes have been brought up. All the bodies have been brought up. But if you could land nine times and there was no wire to catch you, you landed on this boat that could be weaving like this, bouncing in the lake, you used your brakes and you gunned and got off. Nine times, you didn't kill yourself. Good. They put you and your plane on a train and took you to California. And they put machine guns underneath your wings. And then 